In this video I'm going to build a remote control from scratch that uses the magnetic field of a coil to transmit a signal. If you're into radio control you may have seen other DIY RC controller videos that use pre-built RF modules like an NRF24 or XB to transfer data between microcontroller boards like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi. In this case I'm building the transmitter and receiver hardware from scratch with a little bit of a twist. Rather than a conventional radio transmitter, I'm going to use inductive coupling which relies purely on magnetic fields. Now, if you thought I was going to use some sort of scheme involving permanent magnets and a hamster on a wheel going really fast, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this will still be interesting, I promise. For starters, here's the transmitter circuit. Let's have a look at the schematic to see how it works. Like many of my other circuits I've built that require oscillation, I use a 555 timer to generate the pulses. These resistors and this capacitor control the frequency. The variable resistor has opposing diodes on either side to control the duty cycle of the output, which I've dialed in to be about 95% at 2.6 kHz. The timer output drives a transistor that both inverts and amplifies the output, which converts the 95% duty cycle output to a 5% duty cycle. The transistor's output is then used to drive a pair of transistors that amplify the timer signal even further and drive the gate of the MOSFET. When the MOSFET is turned on, current starts to flow through the transmitter coil, but when it's turned off, the energy stored from the coil's inductance uh, causes an oscillation that bounces back and forth against the capacitor. Because voltage actually goes negative during this oscillation, a blocking diode is needed to prevent current from coming back up from ground through the MOSFET. The second diode here is used to protect the MOSFET in case of a spike in voltage that could exceed the voltage limit between the MOSFET's drain and source. If that happened, the diode would start conducting first, saving the MOSFET from being destroyed. Finally, the relatively large inductor and capacitor form a low-pass filter that smooths out current draw of the voltage source. Let's look at the waveforms to get a better idea of what's happening when the MOSFET switches. When the FET turns on, current begins to rise through the transmit coil. The coil has some inductance, so it limits the rate at which current can build up. The rate of current buildup is given by voltage divided by inductance. After a little bit of tinkering, I adjusted the duty cycle on my timer from 5% to about 3.4%. At 2.6 kHz, this works out to an on time of about 13 microseconds. With 5.3 microhenries of inductance on my transmit coil, that means the coil current will rise to about 30 amps during the on time of the MOSFET. That sounds like a lot, but remember it's only at peak current for a very short time. When the MOSFET is suddenly shut off, the energy in the coil is released and bounces back and forth between the coil and the capacitor at the LC resonant frequency, which is about 69 kHz. Now, I'm only supplying the circuit with 12 volts, but the sudden release of energy from the coil causes the voltage to spike way beyond that. By knowing the coil inductance and current, the inductive energy can be calculated then by setting that equal to the formula for capacitor stored energy, and knowing the value of my capacitor, I can solve the equation for voltage, and the result is 70 volts. It's important to do these calculations ahead of time with a circuit like this because the voltage spike needs to be kept below the maximum voltage the MOSFET or blocking diode can handle. If the voltage across the transmit coil is measured, it'll look like this. This is actually the same thing I did in my video on ignition coil driver circuits. Except in this case, the secondary coil is on the other side of the house and instead of creating really high voltage arcs, it's creating a signal. Okay, that's great in theory, but let's see how it actually works. Here's the transmit coil. It's made from three turns of 12 gauge copper wire with a 10 inch diameter. Let's hook it up to the driver circuit and see if the theory matches the actual behavior. The voltage peak is slightly higher than expected, but otherwise it behaves exactly as predicted. If you ignore the sound of the 3D printer in the background, you can actually hear the 2.6 kilohertz tone from the circuit switching. And there's the 69 kilohertz resonant frequency. The only problem I encountered was that the MOSFET and diode were both getting slightly hot after a few minutes of running, so I installed a small fan to keep them at a reasonable temperature. I'll use this coil of wire connected to an LED to demonstrate that the transmitter is working. As you can see, the circuit is actually just a wireless power transmitter. The only difference with this particular one is that the output is modulated with the pulse tone to produce a signal, whereas most wireless power circuits produce a continuous wave. The circuit is really just an electrical transformer, where you've got an input coil, an output coil, and a core. 
The core is really important because it's made of highly permeable material that you could think of as being extremely conductive to magnetic flux. With a good core, a transformer can achieve nearly 100% energy transfer from one coil to another. If you take the core away, the transformer still works, but it's just a piece of crap that nobody would want to buy. You might only get 10 or 20% energy transfer between coils, even if they're right on top of each other. Even if you space the coils farther apart, the transformer technically still works, but now instead of a piece of crap, it's just all around awful. But if you're not concerned about power transfer and you just want a signal, which is what I want, this is just fine. This is how RFID works, and also how rotary transformers work, which are really cool because they can transmit data or power between rotating objects. The main difference between wireless communication this way versus a radio is that I'm using inductive coupling, meaning the alternating magnetic field is the only mechanism used for transferring energy. By contrast, a radio wave has an electrical and magnetic field component to it, which are 90 degrees out of phase. For a vertical antenna, the electric field vector is going up and down, and its accompanying magnetic field is going side to side, perpendicular to the antenna. The problem with radio transmitters at really low frequencies like this, where we're in the tens of kilohertz, is that the antenna has to be absolutely enormous to radiate a reasonable amount of power, and you need an extremely good ground plane for the transmitter. In this frequency range, that usually involves dozens of metal rods driven into the ground over a huge area, maybe as big as an acre. On the other hand, the advantage of a radio is that the signal propagates much farther. In an oversimplified theoretical case, imagine a transmitter as a point in space and the energy is radiating out in all directions. As it radiates out, it's covering an ever-increasing area that looks like the surface of a sphere, meaning the signal strength would drop with the square of distance. Double the distance and the signal strength drops by a factor of four, for example. Now that may seem bad, but it's a lot better than the loss you get with inductive coupling. The magnetic field of a current through a wire also falls off with distance, but because current is always traveling in a loop, there's always going to be an opposite field vector from the diametrically opposed section of any point on the loop. When you're close to one section of the loop, the field from that section is dominant, but as you get farther and farther away from the loop, the difference in distance between one pole of the loop and the other starts to become negligible, and the fields rapidly cancel each other out. All the while, the vector magnitudes are also diminishing, and so the signal strength drops off at approximately the 3.5th power of distance. For example, double the distance and the signal strength drops by a factor of more than 11. Triple the distance and you're down by a factor of almost 50. Now that I've covered the theory, let's continue with the build. The transmitter was pretty easy to construct, but the receiver will be a little bit trickier. I'll start by making the coil, which will use a 3D printed ring to form a 12 inch circle with 100 turns of 26 gauge wire. The diameter of the receiving coil matters a lot for range, and I'll compare the 12 inch coil to a 3 inch coil with the same number of turns to demonstrate that difference. Let's start with the 3 inch. I made the room a little bit dark so that the LED is easier to see. I have to be within about 10 inches for the 3 inch loop to light up. And now the 12 inch loop. There's a little bit of light on the LED as far away as 4 feet, so nearly 5 times the range of the 3 inch diameter coil. This comparison would directly correlate to signal strength too. For a more consistent comparison, I placed both coils on top of a stool as a reference distance and measured their voltages. The 3 inch coil produced a peak of about half a volt, while the 12 inch coil peaked at over 26 volts. That's a difference of over 50 fold, or plus 17 decibels. I compared the coils at a few other reference distances, and the relationship remained more or less the same. Because of the extreme changes, it's a lot more useful to look at the values on a logarithmic plot. Now I need to establish some kind of filter to reject unwanted noise and only listen for the 69 kHz carrier frequency of the transmitter. To do this, I need to place the correct value capacitor in series with the receiver coil to get it to resonate at the transmitter's frequency. To do this, first I need to know my coil inductance. My meter claims it's 7.1 millihenries, but it usually reads low, so I hooked up a 1 mic capacitor and measured the ring on an oscilloscope, and the frequency corresponded to 8.2 millihenries. That means I need 646 picofarads to hit 69 kilohertz, so I used a 20 to 365 pico tuning cap in parallel with a pair of 220 pico caps. Let's see how it looks on the scope when I try to tune in the receiver. And right there, it looks like I found the sweet spot. Okay, so the receiver coil is tuned in, now it's time to design and build the receiver amplifier circuit. The full receiver amp circuit looks like this, but I'll break it down one piece at a time and explain what's going on. For starters, we've got this LM7805. 
This is just a linear regulator that takes in 6 to 30 volts and puts out 5 volts. The capacitors here are just to get rid of any stray noise or ripple. Linear regulators are less efficient than switching converters, but they're pretty much required for any radio type device because they produce almost no electrical noise. Now let's look at the first stage of the amplifier. The inductor and variable cap represent the receiver coil and tuner which we just looked at. The cap going into the base of the first transistor is there for DC blocking so that only AC gets amplified from the coil. This 10 meg resistor puts a bias current on the NPN transistor so that it's pulled above its turn on threshold. Current goes into the base and gets amplified coming out. That current then pulls down the PNP transistor which causes it to conduct through the 220 ohm resistor which ideally should have a 2.5 volt drop across it so that it's biased into the middle of the supply voltage. Both transistors have a gain of approximately 140, so collectively they amplify by a factor of about 20,000, or plus 43 decibels. When I built out the board and probed the voltage across the 220 ohm resistor, it was in fact very close to 2.5 volts. This is done so that any alternating current that's amplified has the widest range possible to change voltage without getting clipped out. If the bias is too low, the signal can get the bottom of the waveform cut off, and if the bias is too high, the top of the waveform can be cut off. Now in all likelihood, the amplitude of the signal on the first stage won't be high enough for that to be an issue, but it's still a good idea to give it some breathing room. Unfortunately though, there still seems to be a good amount of noise that gets through the amplifier first stage, so I put an LC bandpass filter after it to try and get rid of anything outside the 69 kHz from the transmitter. The filter consists of DC blocking capacitors on the input and output, and an LC tank with a 69 kHz resonant frequency, and some resistors to set the input and output impedance. The bit about the impedance is still a little unclear to me, so I probably didn't choose the optimal resistor values here. I've been leaning on this calculator on rftools.com to help with filter design because there's still some details about the math that are unclear to me. So the filter worked, but even at the target frequency it caused almost 12 dB of attenuation, so I definitely need to look more into that whole input versus output impedance thing, because in theory there should be 0 dB of attenuation at the target frequency if it's optimized. Fortunately, that 12 dB drop from the filter is no big deal, because I'm just going to apply yet another 43 dB of amplification with the second stage. This is set up almost the same as the first stage, but the output end is just a little bit different. I've got the same bias current and resistor value, but this time the signal that's amplified will be much larger, so it's actually going to be clipped. That's okay in this case because at the second stage I'm trying to extract the square wave tone, so I don't need the full waveform. The damped oscillations are going to get amplified and clipped, and I'll be left with a waveform that looks like this. Here's what it looks like on the scope. Now the only thing left to do is to get rid of the high frequency carrier wave and I'll be left with a much lower frequency signal. Doing this is as simple as just adding an appropriate value capacitor in parallel with the output resistor which will act as a low pass filter. Here's what the signal looks like after the addition of a capacitor. Finally, to make the signal as clean as possible, I pass it through a Schmidt trigger. A Schmidt trigger eliminates jitter by having a hysteresis, meaning it transitions from low to high at a much higher voltage than it transitions from high to low. In my case, the triggers I had on hand were the inverting type, so I had to run the signal through two of them. So here's the finished amplifier board, and here's what the cleaned up output signal looks like. Now it's time to bust out the Arduino and write a little bit of code to make the signal do something useful. The output of the amplifier is fed into pin 3 of the Arduino, and the LM7805 provides the board power. I use the pulse in function to make the Arduino detect the rising edges of the signal and do some math to calculate the frequency and then read it out on a plot. Even with my cleaned up signal, there's still some variation in the frequency readout, so I'll have to solve that somehow. But before I do that, I want to do a simple test. I'm going to program the Arduino to turn on a MOSFET if the frequency readout falls within 100 Hz of the target 2.6 kHz. The MOSFET will turn on a relay connected to mains power, which will turn a lamp on and off. So here's my transmitter, and sitting about 15 feet away across the kitchen is my receiver connected to mains power and the lamp. Let's see if it actually works. Working exactly as planned. But I'm pretty sure I can do better than a simple on-off switch, so it's time to modify the transmitter a little bit. I rewired the variable resistor on the timer to go from producing a constant frequency with a variable duty cycle to a variable frequency with a constant pulse width. Keeping the pulse width constant would allow me to maintain the same amplitude peak as you can see here when I probe the transmitter coil. 
I can now adjust the pulse frequency from 1.3 to 2.3 kHz. Here's a look at the frequency plot on the receiver when I sweep through the range on the transmitter. I was able to smooth out the jitter a little bit by adding a moving average in my Arduino code, but the farther away the transmitter got from the receiver, the worse the signal quality got, as you can see here. So technically it's still averaging out to the right value as far away as 60 feet, but to make it accurate I'd have to capture way more moving average samples, like 1 or 200, which would slow down the response time quite a lot. Okay, back to the code. I'm going to map the frequency range of 1300 to 2300 to the output range for the Arduino servo library which is 0 to 180, then use the board to write to a standard RC servo which will be powered off the 5 volt rail on the receiver. Let's see how it works. Here the transmitter and receiver are 20 feet apart. I can increase the distance further, but it's most reliable inside of 20. So there you have it, a working single channel remote control using only magnetic fields through inductive coupling. This is my first attempt at building a remote control and I think there's a huge amount of room to improve on range, reliability, and the number of channels I could control. I hope you found this helpful and thanks for watching.